Good morning. Of Rome's 11 principal aqueducts, the L'Aqua Vergine is the only one in almost continuous use since antiquity. Commissioned under Emperor Augustus to deliver water to the low-lying campus marshes and supply the baths of Agrippa near the Pantheon, the aqueduct was dedicated on June 9th, 19 BCE. According to Roman hydraulics historian Catherine Wentworth Rinney, the enterprise was privately financed by Consul Marcus Agrippa as part of a larger urban water infrastructure improvement program. Julius Sextus Frontinus, the first century CE water commissioner and author of the Aquiductu Urbis Rome, noted that the aqueduct supplied water for both public structures and private concessions. Sourced primarily from the underground springs of the Sorgenti di Salone, east of Rome, near the eighth um, ancient milestone on the Villa Colatina, and engineered as a gravity-fed system along its 21 kilometer length, the aqueduct was principally a subterranean infrastructure. Frontinus quantified the aqueduct's length as 14,105 paces, of which 19.4 kilometers was underground and 1.83 kilometers was above ground. The historian David Carmen argues that the, aque the aqueduct's subgrade specus or conduit may have contributed to its longevity, making it less susceptible to damage in addition to the renowned quality of its water. The aqueduct specus, approximately 4.2 meters high, was constructed of arched brick-lined tunnels in opus reticulatum, excavated into volcanic tufa up to 40 meters below grade in order to provide the necessary depth for gravity-fed delivery from source to terminus. Water descended along the aqueduct's underground specus at a gradual rate of 13 centimeters per kilometer starting from approximately 26 meters above mean sea level and terminating at 19 meters. The late 19th century topographer and archeologist Rodolfo Lanciani estimated the aqueduct's output of 158,202.7 cubic meters daily. Although the aqueduct's volume was augmented by tributaries or feeder channels, which increased the influx of impurities, the Virginia was unique in that it did not originally have a sequence of clearing or settling tanks placed along the course of the specus where soil and sediment could gather. Instead, the aqueduct's linear course was punctuated by a series of bends or zigzags, so deposits could accumulate. In his treatise on building, the Architectura, Marcus Vitruvius Polio, described puncturing the top of the channel at regular 240 foot intervals and constructing a series of vertical shafts or pozzi from the top of the channel to grade. These shafts had several functions, including allowing the introduction of air to mix with the water in the subgrade specus and providing access for maintenance crews to conduct surveys, perform repairs, and collect and remove built up sedimentary material and calcium deposits, which might otherwise obstruct the water's regular flow. Shafts were capped at grade with travertine markers called chippi, either cylindrical, pyramidal, or rectangular and stepped in shape that acted as manhole covers. Spacing these number chippi approximately 71.3 meters apart marked the underground location of the aqueduct. Some examples are shown on the slide. Spacing these number cheap B also allowed for a convenient reference point for maintenance crews and served to warn property owners from encroaching on an aqueduct's right of way or vincolo di rispetto. Unpublished papal and municipal records of inspections, legislative actions, repairs, and alteration campaigns concerning the aqueduct and its fountains appear in the collections of the Archivio Apostolico Vaticano, the Archivio di Stato, the Archivio delle Presidenze delle Aquedotti Urbani, uh, Departmental Sovrintendenza Archives, the offices of the ECEA, 
and the Achea Salvatoio de Janicolo archives in Rome. Both published and unpublished documentation of the aqueduct's history is extensive, and I would refer those who are interested to the paper upon which this lecture was based for more information. Following Rome's incorporation into the Kingdom of Italy in 1870, jurisdictional control of the Vergine was transferred to Achea, a precursor to the current water management agency, Achea. Hacienda Comunale Energia e Ambiente. An undated Achea document titled L'Aquedotto Vergine e La Fontana di Trevi noted, the last century has been the most disastrous for the aqueduct. In particular, the development of immense new periferia neighborhoods during the 1950s and 60s, in large part without authority and therefore disorganized, and construction without supervision above the aqueduct and the springs caused irreversible collateral damage to the aqueduct and resulted in infiltration. Some images are shown in the slide. The combination of unregulated development above the aqueduct and the introduction of contaminants into the soil irreversibly compromised its water quality. The environmental degradation, infiltration, and collapses in the aqueduct's channel confirmed by inspections performed between 1957 and 60 and the failure of prior efforts to consolidate and strengthen the aqueduct led the Achea to decide to declassify the water from potabile to non potabile in 1961. To mitigate the structural compromise to the aqueduct, the Achea introduced localized concrete reinforcements of the aqueduct specus. An undated Achea document described the reinforcement process called intubazione in this way. Achea intervened with works to consolidate and stabilize the conduit using strong methods, introducing new conduit made from cement of smaller diameter than the aqueduct. The process consisted of inserting uniform diameter concrete tubes inside the historic channel. The voids between the masonry channel and the new concrete tube were filled with poured concrete Today, the Vergine provides water for ornamental fountains and the irrigation of public parks with a flow rate of 300 liters per second. Stewardship is defined as the long-term care and protection of a historic property by an owner or the public. The legal mechanisms currently in place to protect Rome's cultural patrimony primarily consist of national statutes, a municipal preservation agency, municipal building and zoning code and a national planning law whose enforcement is the jurisdiction of the municipality. The situation of cultural heritage protection in Rome is further complicated by the fact that it is a stratified hybrid of municipal and state oversight with responsibilities divided among a plethora of departmental agencies. In the case of the Vergine, the aqueduct is officially protected as an ancient monument of national significance Due to its age, physical length, and public service utility, hydraulic infrastructure often falls under the jurisdictional purview of multiple agencies. The Vergine is both an intramura and an extramura form of cultural heritage. Its length is governed by the Achea and the Sovrintendenza per i beni e attività culturali for both the Comune di Roma and the Regione Lazio. In addition, the Officio Vincoli the department charged with overseeing right-of-way protections as mandated by a restrictive covenant, Vincolo di Spetto, aims to protect the city's archaeological and architectural heritage. The Vergine's channel is protected by a subset of the Vincolo called a fascia di rispetto, defined by a six meter wide zone at grade level and a 100 meter zone below grade within which certain types of construction are restricted or prohibited. Some examples of the chippi in the field are shown in the slide. To plot the aqueduct's course and locate the over 100 extant and accessible chippi in Rome and the periferia, the team carefully reviewed archival and historic records. Due diligence efforts included reviewing reports drawings, maps, aerial photographs, public works found in private institutional and government libraries and archives in Rome, 
Achea granted access to the Servetoio di Genicolo archives, including unpublished documents, distribution maps, longitudinal profiles, detailed elevations, plans, and sections of the aqueduct. Vittorio Nicolazzo's 1999 treatise was particularly instructive in documenting the construction and alteration history of the aqueduct and its fountains. In terms of cartographic review, the team examined Catherine Wentworth's Rini's Aqua Urbis Rome timeline maps, Studium Urbis's 1748 Gian Battista Noli map of Rome, and contemporary maps, including Google Earth. Field survey was carried out in small teams using digital cameras and a combination of historic and contemporary maps, commencing at the Sorgenti di Salone and progressing along the aqueduct's route all the way to the Trevi Fountain, which is the demonstration or Mostra Fountain of the Vergine, as well as the remains of the Terme Agrippe, south of the Pantheon. The cylindrical chipus and the tombino at the British school were temporarily lifted up and the pozzo beneath was exposed for the benefit of the team survey. A chair granted access permission to the Sorgenti di Salone and the Ciocciola del Pincio, and Acea and the Sorrentendenza per i Beni Culturali granted access permission to the interiors of the Trevi Fountain. GPS survey was carried out using an up-to-date GPS receiver able to perform RTK surveys supported by the permanent GPS network a pioneer positioning and navigation service at the time of the field campaign, which was established and provided by the Geodesi and Geomatics Division of the Sapienza University of Rome. The service allowed survey in near real time of more than 100 GP with a mean accuracy in the range of five to 10 centimeters in one day of field work without any further need of post-processing. The GP locations were estimated in the official European and Italian reference frame, using the cartographic coordinates for zone 33 in order to be represented on the official map of Rome municipality at 1 2000 scale, realizing a dedicated GIS, a map as shown in the slide, which represents geotag data for each chipus was produced using the ARC reader. During the survey, the team anticipated a number of issues, including post 9-11 concerns associated with water security, restrictive policies for accessing sites which are commonly closed to the public, and deterioration of historic infrastructure in multiple agency jurisdiction. As a consequence of Achea's intubation process, the specus has in multiple instances been severed from some of the vertical shafts with which it was formerly connected. This has in turn rendered the shafts and the markers which capped them obsolete. Attempting to locate Chipi amidst barbed wire fencing, garden centers, high-speed rail construction sites, informal settlements, institutional campuses, parking lots, public gardens, residential apartment blocks, undeveloped fields, and vehicular artery rights of ways were presenting numerous logistical challenges. These fragmented, isolated remains evidence physical deterioration, concealment, encroachment, and demolition. Many of these markers are abandoned, suffering demolition by neglect. A small number of stone markers survive within the manicured lawns and pathways of public parks, such as the Villa Ada and the Villa Borghese. Except for the most attentive observer, the aqueduct's linear course is imperceptible. Public consciousness of the integral connectivity between these at-grade heritage markers and the aqueduct's subgrade specus has been lost. Historic waterworks should be preserved, whether operable or decommissioned, whether in whole or in part, because they inform modern water managers, engineers, planners, and preservationists of the historic and the heroic civil engineering achievements of the past realized in the face of needed social change. In the case of the Vergine, the maintenance and functionality of the specus has been prioritized, while the preservation of the at-grade chipi have not. 
a dedicated survey with up-to-date GPS equipment supported by a permanent GPS network for positioning services was performed to collect GP locations. Arguably, opportunities exist for water management agencies to consider the consequences of their decisions affecting infrastructural heritage, not only from standards of utility, performance and reliability, but also from a preservation vantage point as well. For decommissioned and obsolete elements, which no longer serve their purpose-built function, the preservation question is whether compatible value-sustaining possibilities can be found for decommissioned heritage that promotes authenticity and uniqueness and allows these humble monuments to teach future generations about why they were built. The Vertines Linear Corridor could be complemented by informational and directional signage indicating the aqueduct's path within public parks, such as the Villa Ada and the Villa Borghese, the Ufficio di Ville e Parchi Storici has expressed interest in updating their public maps to show the course of the aqueduct for the benefit of heritage tourists, as shown in the current map that is available for the L'Aqua Vergine's fountains in Rome, as shown in the slide. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eric Paler. I'm an associate professor of classics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'm uh, the discussant for this, this panel. Uh, I'm very delighted to get a chance to think about and talk about a little bit with you uh, the papers that I read uh, in the forms that I received, um, and to contribute a little bit to this symposium on water and sanitation management in the ancient Mediterranean. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Kate Trussler for inviting me to uh, be a part of this. Uh, to organizing the session and to uh, making all these things in these uh, difficult ways, uh, in these difficult times possible. It surely would have been nicer to uh, uh, be there with you in par person in San Francisco. Um, I'm going to uh, make a few comments uh, about each paper. Um, I'm going to take these in a slightly different order than they uh, were presented in the, um, uh, are presented in the schedule. Um, and, you know, many of the remarks are, um, uh, are meant to be uh, expansive, uh, that are meant to kind of hone down on a couple of specific points um, and, uh, and to broaden the conversation. So I hope that, uh, I hope that these comments will do that. So let me begin uh, with the paper uh, on the uh, Aquedotto Vergine, Stewardship and Ancient Water Infrastructure in the Modern uh, Roman Peripheria. Um, uh, I thought this was a really interesting deeply interdisciplinary type of study. Um, taking a 2000 year long history of a single piece of infrastructure um, made me think very much about the very different kinds of research skills that must go into this archeological, historical, um, archival, uh, and the different periods in which the research had to un unfold from the eighth and from the obviously antiquity, but the 8th century all the way into the 20th century. So this is um, a, a, a model of what seems to be a very good interdisciplinary style of study. Um, I was also interested and remarked on how the infrastructure as a form of investment in society has proven in this case to be incredibly durable. Um, thinking of uh, many of the aqueducts that continue to function into the post-antique period as well. They had hundreds and hundreds of years lifespans. And I'm reminded then of the uh, streets in Pompeii that I study, which showed a decreasing lifespan uh, over there, uh, over the period in which we can study them in Pompeii. And so thinking of aqueducts, uh, they're, they're really quite durable and important parts of the urban uh, infrastructure. I thought the intubation process was really, really cool. And I, I, um, uh, I wanted to think about the process of taking an ancient infrastructure and then turning it into a modern infrastructure after it had already served the modern periods uh, for a very long time. And I wondered about it in the context of thinking of it as an artifact or an object um, in the way that a artifact, and this is such an imperfect analogy, I'm still trying to get my head around it, but the idea of which an artifact of some particular note gets transformed as it moves out of the ground into the city, into a museum, and becomes part of the uh, urban heritage 
uh, in a way that is uh, intellectual, but here we have this piece of urban heritage uh, that is uh, still quite materially valuable, and that, inter that transformation process is, is really uh, fun to explore in this paper. I'm also uh, interested in the notion of uh, how you preserve these uh, forms of infrastructure and the, and the uh, elements of them, so the, the pyramide and the chipi, uh, where they belong in the, uh, in the city of Rome and in the hinterland, how do we signal their presence I like the idea very much of, of uh, adding signage to the town uh, to alert the presence, uh, alert the, the traveler or to the inhabitant, the presence of this uh, piece of history below their feet. It reminds me of uh, the metaphor that an archaeological, uh, an archaeological, excuse me, in <coughs> an archaeological excavation in its best sense is not in fact a form of destruction, but a form of transformation, one of changing uh, the, uh, the material world into an information world. Uh, and uh, this seems to fit into that, uh, that scope. Um, let me turn now to uh, mosaic water fountains in Pompeii by 